Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and to this new week in which we're going to uh, be completing a review of Daniel's last vision. Are we going to do a review to complete the study that we may end up doing some other type, I guess, like an exam, so to speak? Uh, another review after we're done this review, but we're going to just do sort of a summary. Before we begin looking at that, though, let's let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence into our midst this morning. We ask that you can teach us and that you can bring to remembrance the things that you have been showing us, the needful things to understand. We know that there is so much darkness in this world within within the church and within our own hearts and this light that has been shining revealing the sins the things that are hidden that sometimes it's it's unbearable but we just ask lord that we can confess our sins and forsake them and that we can enter into that light and that we can have that pure conscience undefiled that we can reflect Christ's character to those around us and that they will be drawn to you. Be with us now in this study. Be with each person who's watching these videos. May you bless them. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so good morning again. What you see in front of you is the playlist. And, and I bring it up because it, it has the subject of each of the videos. So we began on August 6th last year. And so we were going to look at Daniel's last vision in the light of present day events. Now, of course, it was Colin who had asked us to look at these things. And, and so we began uh, a very systematic study. We, we looked at uh, the Jubilee, so we looked at the Jubilee cycles and 536. So we looked at, uh, that's one of the first things we looked at. It was how uh, the dates that is going to begin. So obviously that what we're really looking at here is Daniel chapter 11, where it talks about these, these Kings, right? They shall yet three stand up in Persia, etc. And, and so we go back to the chronology of that, right? Revelation 10 and Daniel 10, we look at as well. So we see uh, there, it talks about time no longer. So we address uh, time setting, and um, and then we have a discussion regarding the numbers in Daniel 10 and 7 as the 10th day of the seventh month. So as we begin going through Daniel 10 initially, we deal with why Daniel is having that vision in the first place. And when we're going to go over this again and again. So we go through the kings. Uh, we deal with the temple, Darius's decree, the Cambyses, false murders, Darius, the line of the three kings. Uh, some of these lines that we've drawn out, false murders and the invasion of Iraq. So we're comparing what happened in the past with something in the present. Um, and how does that relate? Uh, and then we get into the discussion regarding the relation of the last seven kings of Persia and the Trump prediction. And then we start looking more specifically at uh, the five are fallen. One is the riddle. And we, we come to the conclusion that Trump is Xerxes. And so we begin looking at the book of Esther. So, and, and anybody, and there's one of these videos, I don't have a description, I'm not sure why. And then we, we spend a lot of time on Esther. Uh, we address apocryphal Esther again, because uh, we had done a study on Esther before in detail. And then we start looking at um, Daniel chapter one to three and specifically Daniel chapter 2. So some of this, you know, we've, we've gone over many times. Now, why did we look at J Daniel chapter 2? Does anybody remember specifically? Why, why did we need to understand Daniel chapter 2? It says Daniel chapter 2 and Alexander. Can you think why we, we looked at Daniel chapter 2? Wasn't it more to understand the progression of the of the different empires? Okay, it was part partly that. Now, remember that they call in, in his revelation, let's put it that way, of what he understood about the riddle of Revelation 17 is that he's going to connect Daniel chapter 3, which we know represents the Sunday law, 
uh, to that riddle, right? And to Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, correct? Okay. Right? Remember how he did that? So, so he was arguing that we're going to have the United States, uh, Persia, which are parallel to each other, that it's going to be Persia all the way through, and that Alexander would be uh, representing Trump, right? So Alexander the Great representing Trump. So that's one of the issues we had to deal with. Could we do that? And, and that was on December 25th, 2021. That was the one point that Colin had made. So I understood that there was connections he was making that we needed to examine. But when he would say that, well, it's got to be Persia all the way through, that because we're going to take this image of Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to say that those are going to be representing the kings, right? That we, we can take that image and we can line it up with the presidents of the United States. And so we're going to end up with, with Alexander as being in there. Does that make sense to people, what I'm talking about? Do people remember that? I think that's pretty direct from what we addressed. Okay. So, so when we looked at Daniel chapter 2 and tried to understand uh, this transition from Media Persia to Greece, we, we couldn't get the idea that Alexander can represent Trump, right? He's Xerxes. He's not going to be Trump or be Alexander. Trump is going to be Xerxes. He's not going to be Alexander. And then we looked at the, the last seven kings of Judah. And we, we start applying this then to the eighth is of the seven. So we started looking. And oh, the other thing that we were doing as well, uh, so this is in September. Uh, we're going to start looking at, at uh, Jeff Pippinger's articles as well, right? So he's going to have these articles. And, and he's going to address Daniel 2. So we started looking at Daniel 2. And at the same time, we start seeing that Jeff is talking about Daniel 2. Okay. So right. it's, it's hard to believe, you know, that that was that long ago. <laughs> but that's what was happening during our studies. So we're looking at Daniel 2. And Jeff is looking at Daniel 2. And he has, he, it makes no sense what he's saying about Daniel chapter 2. So when we deal with the eighth is of the seven. One of the things that we uh, we come to understand is that in our study is that the eighth does not refer to one of the presidents of the United States. The eighth refers to the papacy. And we also had addressed um, that in the last seven kings of Judah, that the eighth, because you have the last seven kings of Judah, Zedekiah being the last king, and, and even even if you want to look at it in the idea that uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes uh, Jehoiachin captive, right? Jehoiachin is the one through which Christ, the, the seed of the woman is going to continue, right? The seed of David. So that Christ is actually a literal descendant of Jehoiachin. He's not a descendant of Zedekiah, right? Okay. Zedekiah has no descendants. All of his children are killed. But it says the Babylon is going to conquer Judah, right? And then it says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. So when it's overturned, that is, Medo Persia is going to conquer Babylon. And then overturned, Greece will conquer Medo Persia. And then overturned, Rome will conquer Greece. And then he shall come whose right it is. So Christ is the eighth. And so we can see then that Christ being the eighth, that what we have with the papacy being the eighth, that is a counterfeit of Christ. So it can't be one of the presidents of the United States, right? Because it's the man of sin that's really the central figure. So we had gone through that. Um, so we started looking at some of Jeff's articles. And then we, in so this is in September, I don't know what the exact date is here, September 24th. We're going to be looking at um, a preview of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 in the context of Daniel's last vision. Uh, we look at the seven-headed, ten-horned beast of Revelation 12, the uh, pioneer understanding of Revelation 12. So we start looking at um, uh, Uriah Smith's 
account of the pioneer view, 12, 13, and 17. And we see that each of these beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 have similarities. That is, they all have seven heads and ten horns, but they're not the same beast. The great red dragon is pagan Rome, primarily Satan, but in a secondary sense, pagan Rome. And, and he's going to give his power seat and great authority to the leopard-like beast of Revelation 13, which also has seven heads and ten horns. There's seven crowns on the seven heads in Revelation 12 on the great red dragon. There's ten crowns on the ten horns of the leopard-like beast. And so that's going to be uh, papal Rome. We understand that. And the ten horns is the divisions of papal of, of, of Rome, right, of the civil power. And then we're going to have the beast of Revelation 17. And the beast of Revelation 17, uh, we know has no crowns, either on the heads or the horns. And um, so when we look at the pioneer understanding of that, we see that there is this, that what, what we have here is uh, this woman who is the papacy riding this beast. So she's fornicating with this beast and that beast is then obviously not the papacy itself it's the civil power this is church and state combined and and then we're going to see that you know there's seven mountains which are the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth and then it says and there are seven kings and we understand that the seven kings are not the seven mountains or the seven heads that it's it's a different power that has seven kings. And we take those kings to be presidents of the United States. So that's one of the insights that we had. Now we looked at uh, Bob Pickle's paper, The Seven Kings of Revelation 17. So we, uh, we reviewed that. We tried to understand the pioneer understanding. And there was uh, some people quite upset with us regarding our understanding of these things. They felt that we had... Um, departed from the truth. And we had done this even earlier when we had looked at uh, that, uh, even before this study, when we had looked at uh, the pioneer understanding of Revelation 12 back uh, almost like a year before that, people were upset about it. And then we had, uh, we, we dealt to to a large degree with all of these, these beasts in, in quite a bit of detail. Um, so we spent a, quite a few weeks dealing with that. And then, um, so we completed the study on the seven kings using the 1533 day prophetic mirror. And I'm not sure what exactly we did there. I don't remember what that one was. Then we had, um, we, we, we began looking at Daniel chapter 11 itself. So this is where we started moving through Daniel 11, drawing these lines, going verse by verse, reading Swearingen and, and the other papers. So we, we dealt with a lot of the symbols, strong numbers. We found that uh, Daniel 11, 11, dealing with Raphia, that uh, we could take the, the strong numbers and uh, we could have them as periods of time. And, and we're going to look at that. We're going to review some of this. So we had all these insights into Raphi and Paneum as we're going through the verses dealing with it. And, and we went over these things again, of course, but uh, this was sort of this initial look at it. And so in November, we started going back, dealing with the civil wars. So we were comparing the civil wars that we see with Greece and, and looking back at 977 BC in Jeroboam, and also the American Civil War. Um, then we had uh, looked at the prophetic mirror. We looked at the Thanksgiving Day prediction, the 235 years. That's the period from 977 to 742. So we were just looking at some of this American history and how it related to this, uh, the division of uh, the kingdom of Israel into north and south, how that related to United States separating from, from Britain, and then also the Civil War itself, this battle between North and South. So all of these things uh, come out of the Thanksgiving Day prediction. Uh, so then by December, uh, 
we began moving further into Roman history, right? So the transition between Greece and Rome as a repeat of history, we dealt with the sons of the breakers of thy people. So there was lots of detail that we had dealing with the strong numbers and the periods of time. So in December, so it's like December 24th, December 25th, we had some understanding of December 25th on our line. And then we began uh, applying this part with Rome exalting itself and how that paralleled with our history prior to 1989. So the Soviet-Afghan war, and we found all kinds of numerical connections with these strong numbers. And then there's some mathematical corrections. We've made some mistakes that we had to correct. We reviewed the number 2688 and the dates connected with Trump and Telford Muse. So part of what ends up happening here is we know on December 30th, so 28th, so we had Daniel's last vision, December 31st. So that was the 30th was the Sabbath. That's when Jeff, uh, 1260 days after July 18th, he's going to reject the symbolic use of numbers publicly. Uh, so we're going to start addressing some of that. So we, we continue moving through Daniel chapter 11 and how the things of the past relate to the present. So I'm just seeing if there's anything here that... So we get into Daniel 11, 23, 24, the Battle of Actium. We deal with the, the line of the times, even for a time. We do a study on the Rosetta Stone. We connect... Uh, 187 weeks. I remember that study. So we're going to go through some of this. I'm just, you know, showing you what what these we dealt with Miller 666 years in the line of Rome from Daniel 11, 23 to 24. And Nero in July 18th, 2020. Of course, Nero, that's that's uh, Odilio's study on Nero. And uh, so then you can see we covered a lot of ground here. So now we're just getting to like study 151. So we're going to complete, we're going to get through Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at, you know, 31 to 37, 36 to 39. And, and we recently had reviewed all of these things, but, but this was our initial examination of these verses. So understanding how the repeat of history works, a fresh look at the present truth application of Daniel 11, 25 to 26. So we keep going back over that history, that history dealing with the transition from Greece to Rome and the beginning of Rome. And then we deal with the three possibilities for Daniel 11, verse 29. So this one here. Um, so remember, we had looked at these different verses. How would we translate this verse? dealing with 360 years and how would we parallel that to our history so this is going to be what we end up coming to understand is that we have this time of the end and the time appointed the time appointed ends up being november 9th 1989 so we should deal with the ships of kittim we, there's a number of lines that we draw and we're going to look at some of those lines so in April, we're dealing with these, these verses, these final verses, uh, moving up to Daniel 11, verse 40. And so all of that history, which we're going to deal with once we look at Uriah Smith. So after we have completed this, we go through Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, just to sort of a cursory look at it. We're then going to look at Uriah Smith. And so that's going to happen way back here in May. So in May, we're going to, well, I'm going to end up going to Australia, and then we're going to start reviewing Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel chapter 12, right? So we're going to have uh, Dwight begin these presentations on going through Uriah Smith's chapter 12, and looks like I got a typo there. So while I'm in Australia, Dwight's leading out. We're going through detail of Daniel chapter 12. And then we're going to have to go back and look at Daniel chapter 10 and 11 as well. So that's what's going to happen there.
So we're going, we, we finished going through Uriah Smith's last month, and then we uh, began looking at other. So once we were done with Uriah Smith, thoughts on Daniel, then we look at uh, David H. Thiel. So we spend quite a bit of time looking at his criticism of, and so we're going to all remember that. That's more recent dealing with the criticism of Louis F. Weir. And then we address the endorsements Ellen White makes of uh, the Daystar article and then Samuel Snow's Midnight Cry. And so that's where we finished off. Okay, so so that, that's a lot of material to review. So obviously we're not going to go like through everything, but I do have a paper that uh, I've begun working on. And that paper uh, I'm going to share. And we're going to go through that as a review. Okay, so you should be able to see that paper there. And right. We're gonna, yep, so we're going to go back to the beginning of it here. So this is is not. I, I did send out a, a paper just on Daniel 11 itself um, on WhatsApp, and that's not this paper. That is, this is more extensive. So that one's just basically Daniel 11. This is going to be. Uh, going through Daniel 10, 11, and 12. So this is going to be a more comprehensive paper. So what we can do is we can read through this, and hopefully this won't be too big a problem going through some of this. I still have a lot more to write, but I have some of the initial stuff written here. And I'm going to change some things, obviously, as I go through and edit it. But uh, this paper is a detailed analysis of Daniel 10 through 12, with a focus upon chapter 11 that assumes pre-existent knowledge or deep interest in the historicist view of Daniel 11 held by Seventh-day Adventist and its Millerite pioneers is not meant as an introduction to Daniel's last vision. And this does not mean that the reader who does not have this knowledge cannot benefit, but that they will need to go slowly and take time to look at other material. It is not a light read though we hope it will be interesting. Further, there is also an assumed knowledge of the present truth movement led by Jeff Pippinger and Future for America in regard to the failed predictions of November 9th, 2019 and July 18, 2020. We hope that this will not hinder the reader. We also address Pippinger's prediction regarding Donald Trump being the last president of the United States and as the one who will bring in the Sunday law. Many of Pippinger's followers are still looking for this eventuality. We take the position that Trump will not be the U.S. president to bring in the National Sunday Law. The author had considered writing a paper for the general reader, but many of the insights into Daniel's last vision would have had would have had to mostly go unexpressed, since it is the context of Pippinger's movement that allows these insights to be realized. We apologize to those who find the paper too dense or who feel that much of what is presented is irrelevant to them. Also, the whole purpose of God's word, the present truth, is the proclamation of the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Some may find this paper deficient in that regard, with much of its content appearing exclusive and esoteric. Again, we apologize. We must assume that the reader understands this larger context and has had an experience with Christ already. In that sense, this paper is not meant as an evangelistic tool. However, it is meant to equip the reader with light that he can share with others in the context of the gospel. And any thoughts about that preface there? In this analysis of Daniel 11, we compare the historical fulfillment with the events from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030, with the former date being the time of the end as understood as the fulfillment of Daniel 1140b, and the latter uh, being the symbolic date counting 2,300 months or 186 years from April 19th, 1844. We are applying the interpretive tools that were utilized in studying the Book of Judges. We direct the reader to Telford Muse Prophecy Conference notes and to the videos of that conference for more detail on the symbolic use of numbers as spans of time and other aspects of biblical chronology. 
Our study of Daniel 11 was at the request of Colin Joseph, who has made several predictions regarding the re-election of Donald Trump and the coming Sunday law under his presidency. As background, we made detailed studies of Daniel 2, 8, 9, the book of Esther, Revelation 10, 12, 13, and 17, as well as the book of Ezra in regard to the chronology of the Persian kings. We also addressed the pioneer understanding of the beasts of Revelation in examining the riddle of Revelation 17, verse 9 to 11. We had concluded that Donald Trump is the fifth king in the line of seven kings. These represent the last seven presidents of the United States. The one which is, the one is, right? So the one which is, the one is, is Biden. Trump's re-election, if it occurs, does not make him the eighth. He will not bring in the Sunday law. And the seventh king, still to be determined at the writing of this paper, will be a Civil War president, whether Trump or someone else. At this point, it looks possible that it could be Trump. Now, just a, a question regarding that. Now, we know that Biden is, is the president. Is it possible that Kamala Harris could be made uh, president prior to the election? Yes. Okay. Now, if that happens, how does that affect the count? Would she then be the 47th president? Yes. Okay. And then what if Trump was reelected? Would he then be the 48th? Yes. Right? Okay. So if we were going to do this count of the seven kings, then Trump would be the eighth in that, in that context, if, if that's how we understand it. Now, do you understand how that can happen? Well, explain it. Okay, there's two ways in which this could this could occur. Mm -hmm. Under one of the articles of the Constitution, Biden could be replaced because he's no longer mentally fit. Right. Which I'm surprised they haven't done that yet. Right. Like like year, years ago. <laughs> well, that's that's being kind. <laughs> Biden could also die. Yeah, he could. And if Biden dies, then Harris becomes elevated immediately to the presidency. Now, then she would be running as president against the former president. Yeah. So under those two circumstances, then Trump, if reelected, would then become the 48th president. Yeah. So. I don't, you know, that that's really the only way I see that occurring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, how that affects how we've been looking at this, this prophecy. So and we're, we're not saying that we're correct that in, in how we understand it, but this is how we understand it. So we have paralleled uh, the kings of Persia. We've paralleled them with the presidents of the United States at the time of the end. So we took the time at the end. We saw that we had uh, Darius the Mede, so he's going to be zero because Cyrus is going to be the first one. And and then those are going to line up with uh, Reagan and Bush the first. So Bush the first is, is lined up with Cyrus. And then three shall yet stand up. You have Cambyses, Paul Smyrnas, and then Darius, Histaspes, right? So we then line those up with Clinton, uh, Bush the second, and then Obama. So Obama lines up with Darius Histaspes. And then after that, you have uh, Xerxes, right? And so then you're going to have Trump is going to be Xerxes. And then, then we have Artabanus, Artabanus, however you say his name, and he's going to line up with Biden, Right. So we can see, you know, how those those line up. And and if we're going to count them right in, in this context, if we're going to line them up at the time of the end, well, then uh, Trump is the fifth and Biden is the sixth. And then it says we're going to have the seventh, which is not yet. Right. They shall continue a short space. And then after that, you're going to have the eighth. And we understand the eighth to be the papacy. Now, we took the position that. Uh, the the seventh would be a civil war president that 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 we have uh, a civil war in the United States that's going to happen whether it was Trump or someone else now of course if we had Kamala Harris be the seventh 
and then Trump gets reelected, then he would be the eighth. And that wouldn't work with how we've understood this, this seven kings. Right. So what, how do we, how do we address that? So we can see that there's a possibility that may not work out the way that we, we understood it. That would fit in with how Colin understands it, because he's going to have Trump as the eighth, but he had a different count, right? Correct. But he would then, using our count, have Trump as the eighth. And then the eighth, of course, is going to bring in the Sunday law. But we understand the eighth to be the beast that was and is not, which I don't think we could possibly look at a United States president itself. But we could say that when you have the eighth, uh, because my view is that when we look at the Persian kings, now who we have uh, Artaxerxes is the seventh, right? Correct. Okay. But do we have Persian kings after that? No. Yeah, we do. We have a bunch of more Persian kings. But they're not mentioned in the prophecies. No, no. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah, and, and that's my point as well. So we have Persian kings after that, but they're not mentioned in the prophecies. They, they're not part of prophecy. And, and that could be very well the case here when we look at these seven presidents, that these are the ones represented, but they're not mentioned, right? That is, they're not part of the prophecy. So you could have other presidents after, you know, the seventh. Right. Does that make sense? So that the eighth doesn't necessarily follow numerically. Now, how do we equate that? Well, we, we believe that this pattern of the eighth is a counterfeit of Christ. And so when we go back to the kings of Judah, we can see that the kings of Judah, the last seven kings of Judah, we're going to have Zechariah as the last king of Judah. But Christ is going to be the eighth. But he doesn't immediately follow after, right? And Babylon, which typifies the papacy, is is going to be there, right? So we have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and then you have Rome, which is connected to Babylon, right? That is, Babylon and Rome are connected by the 666 years, and so it's going to be in the time of Rome that Christ is going to uh, become king, right? Now, he first becomes king, of course, in the sense that uh, when he is resurrected, he's, he's invited in as the king of glory. But we know that, that for him to actually take over the earth again, that's going to happen at the second coming. The, the people not the people follow that or people following what I'm saying about that and how that relates so when we look at the end, we, we have this pattern of the seven and then the eighth, the eighth being Christ. And so when it deals with these presidents of the United States, it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be any more presidents of the United States, but that the prophecy only shows us these seven. And then we're in the time of the Sunday law. And then the eighth is going to be the Sunday law. But there still could be more presidents. If you have a president, if Kamala Harris becomes president and then Trump gets reelected, Trump isn't the eighth. Does that make sense to people? Did anybody agree with me or disagree? Is this, is this something we haven't really discussed? I'm not disagreeing. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, but I could see how, how some people would disagree. They would say, well, no, you need to follow through, but I would think from this pattern that we have of the kings of Judah, that we can see that there's a reason why it's, and I guess the question is, why is it going to just tell us about these seven kings? And, and, and the real thing is, the one which is, is Biden. So we came to the conclusion, the one that is, has to do with the fact that we are brought into that context, that the understanding of that riddle occurs at the time that is, right? And that riddle was never understood before. Now, that seems sort of, um, you know, self-referential, I guess. You could say, well, anybody could say they've understood the riddle. And so the one that is, whatever that riddle is, however they've interpreted it. But remember, 
We've understood that this is light that's being presented now and that the understanding of the one that is couldn't have been understood until the one is, right? Okay. And, and so the, the traditional way of looking at it, the, the original way is the one is, is in the context of John, right? So John is talking about the one that is, that's the way the pioneers understood it. So that was the different systems of Roman government, the one that is, is imperial law. Okay. Then we had another interpretation, which is more common now, is that when it talks about five or fallen one is, it's talking about the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And the one that is, is the United States, right? Now, some will have, you know, communism, spiritualism or something like that. But the five that are fallen, the fifth is the papacy in, in that understanding, the one that has the deadly wound, even though this one doesn't talk about a deadly wound in that context. So they, we've, we've sort of mix these prophecies together. We look at the seven heads are always the same heads. They're always Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, either spiritualism in the United States or the United States and spiritualism, right? So people have different ways in which they're going to apply the seven heads, but they're going to say the one is, is 1798, right? So then we took the position that the one is, because these are the presidents of the United States, they're not the seven heads. So the one that is, is the time in which this is understood. And at that time, it's Biden. And even when, when Colin presents this interpretation, it's already when Biden is the one that is. So to argue, to say that the one that is, is in the time of Trump, didn't really make any sense. Does, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. So he has the one that is to come is Biden, you know. So he has the tr Trump being the one is, which in his count, uh, I think I got that right. So five are fallen. He's going to have, you know, Reagan and um, Bush the first and Clinton and Bush the second and Obama, Obama. And then Trump is the one that is. And then the other that's going to come was Biden. But that doesn't make sense because he doesn't have a way of placing that the one is, is Trump, because it's not understood in the time of Trump. So why would you say that the one is, is Trump? So so anyway, that's how we understood that. So I think it's going to be, um, you know, interesting to see to some degree how people respond as different things unfold, you know, how they're going to interpret this prophecy. Now, if you have Harris win in the election. Now, I still think it's most likely that, that Harris is going to win, even if Trump is way more popular and even if more people vote for Trump, because I, I do think that the American elections are fixed. I don't know what other people think about that, but we'll see, I guess. You know, for Trump to win, it would have to be a failure on the part on the establishment in controlling the election which I, I still think they believe they can do. And I, I think it's possible they can. A am I a conspiracy theorist in saying that? I had thought it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, I really do believe that, that Trump, the election, the last election, and, and the reason why I, I think that is, the reason why he lost, obviously, it can't be proven, right? We don't have the data to prove it because they're not going to look at it openly. But the mail-in ballots should not have counted and they should have been. And that's the only reason why I think that Biden won. But uh, any, anybody else has thoughts on that? Do you think I'm wrong in, in saying that? I mean, that. No, you know, you're that's probably what, right about it. Yeah, it's just, you know, because Republicans I, vote Democrat when they die. I figured that. I figured that the, the globalists weren't going to let him win. So, okay. Now, Rand says YouTube will not allow you to say this. Really? So they won't allow you to say say that, hey? I, I never I never knew that. So you can't say that the election was. Now, what if you say the election was when Trump won, as uh, Hillary Clinton does? Is that allowed? I'm just thinking about how 
angry Hillary Clinton was. Yeah. She was so angry because she probably, probably because it was fixed. I don't know. And then Trump's, Trump came out of nowhere almost like everybody doubted that he could win. How could such a bombastic man win? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're just speaking hypothetically here, right? We don't, we don't know any of this for certain of, but this is sort of the discussion that goes on. So now I think part of the problem that we have in the United States right now is that uh, there is a fear of a civil war in the United States, right? So there is a fear um, that there's going to be, you know, an insurrection of some sort. So when you deal with the January 6th, you have one side that really believes that that Trump whipped up the crowds to go in and storm the Capitol building and to overthrow the election, right? There are people who actually believe that that's what happened, even though it's quite clear that Trump didn't do that. But that's what they believe because that's the narrative that's being promoted. And then you have uh, a whole other group of people who, you know, well, I mean, you do have people that like because of what has happened in the United States. I mean, it's it's a tinderbox. And you have people who probably are willing to overthrow the government if things don't go the way they want on both sides of the issue, whether the people who hate Trump or the people that uh, believe Trump is sort of a, a savior of some sort. So it's it's hard to know what's going on, but the possibility exists right that 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 an election could be fixed in the united states that that's a possibility um you know, pretty big stretch but i with with uh, the way people are reacting it's become a horse race again well yeah it's just hard to know what the truth is i mean that's the real problem with the world right now because of censorship you know so like if youtube decides to make a strike on this video because we're speculating about uh, what's going to happen in the United States. And of course, you know, we're not Americans here, at least I'm not. I'm in Canada. It seems like a rather odd thing to to do, to censor uh, discussion in this regard, because it actually creates the very thing that uh, you want to stop, right? So openness would actually help the situation. But, you know, it could be just the whole issue dealing with social media that has, I, I believe, is a big part in polarizing Americans. That is, prior to social media, people didn't really take these things as personally as they do now. So social media has really warped our perception. It's, it's crowded us together. Our, our world seems more intertwined with what's happening in the media and politics than it did in the past. Kelly, you have some thoughts? I learned how important openness is in grade 12 social studies with uh, at CUC with Dallas Weiss. I remember him well. We uh, got a subscription to Time Magazine, and that was the year we studied the four isms socialism, capitalism, communism. And fascism. And okay. I remember discussing about why we have the Communist Party allowed to be a political party and run in Canadian elections. Mm -hmm. And how that by allowing it, it actually prevents it from become, coming into power. Because people see it for what it is. It's It's like, if you allow it, I guess that's it. Really, you know, people see it for what it is. And if you try to mm -hmm. suppress it, then people become even more interested in it. I don't know. There's something about openness that guarantees it not, not happening. Yeah. I mean, I've seen this in the church, you know, when you try to shut down some sort of, uh, you know, heresy that's, that's come in, some sort of what you consider to be fanaticism. Uh, it helps. It, it just promotes it, right? Even even if it's not fanaticism, whatever it is that you're trying to oppose, if you just allow people to discuss it and look at it, well, then, you know, people can evaluate it. And mm. and if it's not true, people then can reject it. And well, up, up to when I was going through the process of 
leading up to the disfellowship and the pastor standing up in front of the church, 1,100, 1,200 people membership. I might have me mentioned it to, you know, four or five people at that time, but it was spreading like because of rumors and so on. I might have sent a mass email out or something. But mm -hmm. he stood up in front of the church and warned everybody about the 2520. I never would have had that opportunity to tell mm -hmm. everybody about the 2520. He warned them not to listen, and, and all of a sudden, everybody's talking about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if we're going to, you know, if we deal with this, this whole issue of um, what's happening in the United States right now, now I, I'm of the opinion that when people... When people say one thing, but the results are another, the the another is what they want. That is, so you would say, well, you know, it would, would make sense to have openness. But the reason they don't want openness is they do want this division to occur, right? Because they want to destroy what exists. And the best way to do that is to break down communication and create uh, paranoia and fear, right? So that's the result that they're looking for, is the destruction of the present order so that they can bring in their new order, right? That's that's the purpose. And and so people are just pawns in that game, right? They, they, they think, and on both sides of the issue, they think that they're standing for truth, whatever they believe that truth to be, and that the other person is an enemy. And by by buying into that on either side, they've been trapped. And, and so it's it's a very clever plan. The plan is to destroy society, right? The, the purpose of the World Economic Forum is not to bring about their view of the world. I mean, that's what their purpose is. But the purpose is actually to bring disorder. So the things that they're looking for, their goals and their ambitions of how they're going to bring about, you know, this this, this wonderful society, it's extremely unrealistic unre and juvenile. It's not going to happen, but it does bring about a dissolution of society so that someone else can come in and bring about the world that they want. And that, that someone else is the papacy. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, especially regarding the redistribution of wealth mm -hmm. like <laughs> you know when Trudeau came into power our our uh, debt or national debt you look at all the other countries in the world and it kind of roller coasters up and down a little bit little bit but mm -hmm. stays pretty even and then when and Canada's it it was hockey stick inflation never before has it been like that yeah. Just shot straight up above everybody else in the world. And what does our prime minister say? Don't worry about it. The debt will take care of itself. <laughs> yeah. But but you can see that, that what they want is fear, right? That is that is our enemy. The lack of communication, the the polarization of society. And and we always keep thinking, well, you know. Some politician's going to come in in Canada, that's Pierre Polivier, right? In the United States, you know, it could be Trump, like for conservatives. And they think, well, that's going to bring about, you know, a much better world and, and things will be better. And, but, but in reality, these are not going to solve the problem because the problem is the division that exists within these countries, that exists within the world, right? Then, like, it doesn't matter what they do, there's division that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, when, when a couple's having problems and they decide to, to talk to a lawyer. It's not in the lawyer's best interest for the couple to resolve things. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's, it's in the lawyer's best interest to, to create as much conflict as possible so that they can, like a vulture, uh, reap the benefits of the demise of that marriage. Right? So... They're, they're going to try to take as much of the couple's money as they can, right? So, so I always tell people, if you're going to get divorced, don't go to a lawyer. Go to an accountant. <laughs> um, my, lawyer, my lawyer kept pushing for a list of assets, and that would have cost a whole bunch more money. And I kept saying, we don't have anything. Just 
do it. <laughs> Just give us a divorce. Yeah. Well, I, I know when, when I went to a lawyer, uh, and, and I never hired a lawyer. But uh, just went to, you know, get some free advice from lawyers. They give you a little bit, like an hour. And I told this lawyer what I thought about lawyers. He, he, he was really upset with me. He says, what you're saying is extremely offensive. And I said, well, but it's the truth, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you, you have a vested interest in, in conflict. You know, your, your personal uh, interest is in seeing the marriage fall apart. And that's that's how we see it in this world today when it comes to all of these different groups fighting all this polarization. There's somebody that's benefiting from it, right? It's not the people who are polarized. None of us benefit when, we ha when we're in conflict with others and we stop communicating and listening, right? Same within this movement. You know, when people just started shutting each other down, you know, Satan... He has been seeking to create this division within the movement, right? That's, that's the work of Satan. He's ultimately the one behind it. And, and yet we buy into it. And, you know, now when you try to point out to people, the problem is that we, we really need to be speaking to each other and communicating. Um, you would think people would listen to that. They would, they, would, they would see that that makes sense. But Satan has so controlled our minds that we somehow think, that we're standing for truth when we're tearing down others. And it's just not the case. So that's, that's the situation we have in the world. And that's, that's, you know, so when we have this situation about what's going to happen in an election, I mean, we have no idea. All we know is that things are going to fall apart. And whoever becomes president is sort of immaterial as far as the goals, you know, like, because it's going to be divisive in the United States, no matter what happens. Just, just a quick story on the lawyer thing. There's a, this is a true story. A couple were going through the process of divorce, and a year later, they still don't have it. Half of the divorce, the lawyers just kept going back and forth. So the couple decided to do a test. They told each of their lawyers something about some imaginary property that they had. The mm -hmm. wife and the husband told each of their lawyers. And it's supposed yeah. to be in confidence. Well, next thing you know, the other lawyer knows about this property. And uh, they were talking to each other, extending yeah. the divorce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So each of them said they had a secret property, and the other yeah. lawyer said... Well, right, is that what you're saying? Each is it told, to, they didn't just tell one lawyer, right? You said they told both lawyers. No, no, yeah. The wife told her lawyer, the husband told his lawyer. Yeah. That they, you know, the husband says to the lawyer, I have this property, I don't want the wife to know. Okay. And the same with the wife, says to yeah, her lawyer, okay. I have this property, I don't want my husband to know. Well, a the different, next thing, yeah. Yeah, a different lawyer. Yeah. Her lawyer. His, his, yeah, his lawyer, her lawyer. Yeah. Respective lawyers. And then yeah. uh next the next week, uh there's a claim from his lawyer to her lawyer. That, well, it basically extended the divorce because they weren't supposed to know this information. It was told to their lawyer in confidence. Next thing the wife's lawyer knows about it because that lawyer told him but didn't tell the husband that he had told the wife's lawyer and vice versa. They were having yeah. coffee together. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, so lawyers, they have uh, they have a conflict of interest. That is kind of confusing, ain't eh? I couldn't understand okay. what, what, what lawyer did what. Yeah, okay, I'll explain it. I'll explain yeah, it. Yeah, please. Each couple says that they have a, a piece of property that the other doesn't know about. <clears throat> And they, and they tell, tell, each, they they tell, tell their them. lawyer about this that they don't want the other to know. But the other lawyer on both sides ends up learning about this piece of property that doesn't exist. But Well, how many lawyers are involved? Two or There's three? two lawyers. Each has their own lawyer. Well, if, you, if, okay. but if the wife tells the husband, tells the lawyer, her, her lawyer, that he had a property and the other one tells his lawyer that he has a property. 
Let me okay. try. Right. Let me, right. It's not the same property. It's not no, the same. Let me property. try. Let me try. All right, you. I got right. it now. You got. Yeah, I got okay. it. Yeah, we got it. It's not it the same property. Test. It was a test. Yeah. Right. Just a they test were testing whether were the lawyers were talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. But you know, so when we try to relate this to what's happened within the movement, so so we have this. This is an example, an illustration of first that we need to communicate with each other, like a husband and wife who are going through a divorce. You, you don't want to be communicating through someone else, especially when that person has a vested interest in seeing your your marriage end. Right. Such as a lawyer, but even friends and things like that. If you are going to talk to someone, you need to talk to a counselor together. Right. Because you have a communication breakdown. You know, unless it's like, you know, there's other reasons for divorce. But often it's just, you know, husband and wife stop talking to each other. They they start talking to their friends. They start imagining all kinds of things about what the other person thinks and so forth. And and so a divorce is a really good illustration of what has happened uh, within the United States, which what happens between people all the time, whether groups of people. I remember back in, in the 90s when the Seventh-day Adventist Church put out um, in uh, the, re the review, the Adventist Review, uh, a little booklet called Issues, and then they published another big book called Issues, um, dealing with um, Hope International and the other groups in the Pacific Northwest that they saw as a threat to the church. And so basically it was a bunch of gossip and misrepresentation about Hope International and uh, I can't remember the other institutions uh what's the other one can't think of it were they, were they coming out against light bearers at that time no light bearers had already seceded uh and and sold themselves out to the conference by that time okay so light bearers saw that this was coming and so they they sucked up to the church so that they, they wouldn't be part of being attacked like so it was um Anyway, I just can't think of the other names of the two other groups. But anyway, the point was, you know, this doesn't really help the situation. They, they never sat down and talked to these groups. They just listened to the rumors and gossips and their imaginings about the motives of, of these groups, right? And, of course, these groups themselves also had, you know, problems with the church, which if they had spent time, you know, trying to work together, it would have been different. But... The point is, it doesn't help a situation. If you want to, to help somebody, if you want to redeem them, if you believe that they're in error, the one thing you don't want to do is misrepresent them publicly to others. It's, it's not going to help redeem them, right? Of course, the church wasn't really interested in that, right? They weren't really interested in bringing this group back into the church or anything like that. They just, you know, they have their own reasons, right? Because in order to communicate, you, you would have to actually honestly and openly look at yourself. And that's what we're not willing to do, right? Yeah. The reason why we don't want to communicate, because if I communicate, then I have to openly and honestly look at the things that I have done wrong, right? In a marriage, when it breaks down, or in the movement, when we have this division. People don't want to set aside their their ego, their pride, and admit that they're wrong about something. Sometimes one party does, but the other doesn't as well. That mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes even now, you know, when you see that you've done something wrong, you need to, you need to apologize, confess, say, I did this wrong, here's what I did wrong, and never have an excuse about it, right? You can't say, well, I did this wrong, but, you know, it, it wasn't really my fault. <laughs> well, I want to apologize for butting in a while ago. No, 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 no. no, no. William, no. that's invited and encouraged. Yeah, please, there's no please reason always to do. Yeah. We anyway, want to hear from you. Well, yeah. I was I was reading some of God's word right here, and I just wasn't paying that much attention. I apologize. Yeah. Well, you should apologize for apologizing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's Canadian. <laughs> we always say sorry, but yeah. really 
please, William. Always, always join in. Yeah. I yeah. feel like I talk too much. I want everyone else to as well. Yeah. So when we deal with this situation that we, we, we can see what happens on, on a personal level in a marriage breakdown or within this movement. So we, we can see that within the world, there isn't really a desire to know the truth, right? That these different groups are not interested in, in the truth. They're interested in, in their agenda, improving themselves to be correct. And so Satan takes advantage of this. The only way that this can be undone is if everyone became converted or the vast majority of people were converted, right? So because we don't have the gospel, it's inevitable that the world is going to go in this direction. And so from a Christian point of view, that's why we don't believe in politics, right? Politics are never going to solve the problem. Getting your man in power isn't going to change the world for the better. We, we, we fall into the delusion that it will, you know, because, you know, oh, the Jesus. leader has our values. We think that that's going to somehow bring about a better world. But everyone has to be changed, right? Control will not bring about the resire, desired result. You were going to say something, oh. William? I was just going to say Jesus is the only one who can solve the problem. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, that, and that's the counsel, isn't it? I mean, that, that's what she says about politics. Ellen White says about politics. It's like we can't vote in the kingdom of heaven, and that's that's what we want. Mm -hmm. And that and that's a shortcut. We think that somehow, if 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 everybody else just did what was right, then the world would be a wonderful place. But the reality is, if we do what's right. That, that's that's the only thing we have control over. Then no matter what happens in the world, you know, we're part of God's kingdom. And that's the kingdom we look forward to. Mm. So, yeah, so we, you know, we have, you know, conspiracy theories, all these different things. Um, even if some of them are true, Satan allows them to happen because he wants to create fear. Right. So fear is the opposite of love as far as I'm concerned. And he wants to create division. He wants us, and, and, and we, we get caught up in what's happening in the world as if somehow, if we know what's happening, then, then we're going to be safe. And that's not how it works, right? It's knowing Christ that's going to make us safe. Unraveling Satan's deceptions is... Is not about knowing, you know, exactly all of the different organizations and, and uh, plans that he has. We just need to recognize that Satan is a destroyer and that uh, if we if we get caught up in the things that he's doing is somehow uh, that we can be you know, like this world is is not a safe place. Right. So we can't focus upon this world. We're never going to make it a safe place. So anyway, that's, uh, I, I think, an extremely important uh, point to understand is in why we're even studying this stuff at all, right? It's not, it's not just a bunch of knowledge. So the reader must recognize that we cannot know the future or how it will unfold. We can only understand events that are past. And even then, our understanding of past events is partial. Until all truth is unfolded, we see through a glass darkly. However... We believe that God gives light for our feet, but we may not stray from the path. Uh, the general outline of the historical application that we have followed and the format of placing the historical application in the text of Daniel 11 in square brackets, we have borrowed largely from Swearingen's book, Tidings from the Northeast. We have also referenced to Rye Smith's, Smith's thoughts on Daniel, as well as the work of the pioneers and other sources. However, we have found that there are many details that have gone unnoticed, as well as mistakes and inconsistencies that have needed to be corrected. Sometimes these corrections are surprising in that these were often right under our noses, sometimes even partially seen by others before being dismissed. Some historic and present truth movements within Seventh-day Adventism have seen Sister White's endorsement of Smith's Daniel and Revelation as placing it on nearly an inspired footing. 
And this has caused many to adopt views regarding the last verses of Daniel 11 differently than we have. And we will address these differences and show why Smith's view, which he inherits, inherits from Protestant commentaries and filtered through Josiah Litch and Millerite understanding, is contrary to scripture and statements in the spirit of prophecy. We will not be able to address everything we have studied in detail, for we will for that, we will direct the reader to the video record of our studies of Daniel's last vision found on YouTube. And while these studies are best understood in the context of historic Seventh-day Adventism, we hope that there is enough for the general reader to gain insight from these studies, even if they have differing interpretations of many of the passages. It is our hope that our thoroughness will help others, even when they may dis disagree with some of our methods or draw different conclusions. In no way do we consider this paper to be the final word upon Daniel's last vision. However, we do believe it is the result of an unfolding of light that God is bringing to his people at the present time. That is, we believe it to be present truth. So, so what I hope to do here is because we're going to have three more studies before I go away. And I think, Dwight, you're, you're still going to do the study on Thursday morning. Is that the plan? Even though I won't be here, if Dwight's still there. I had to step away for a second. What was that? On Thursday morning, I'm not going to be here. Are right. you, you going to do the study on Thursday morning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll still have the studies uh, continue, just different people leading out. So so what I want to do um, tomorrow, I'm going to look at just an overview of Daniel 10 and then uh, see how far we get. And then an overview of Daniel 11 on, on uh, Tuesday and then an overview of Daniel 12 on Wednesday. So, I mean, it's it's just going to be cursory, but I'm going to bring out sort of the highlights as we go through this review. Now, so one of the things that that happened is we, we went through this study and I know that, you know, not everybody followed every single study, but because of what we had studied in in the book of Judges, we, we use this approach for Daniel's last vision, that is, we. We dealt with a lot of symbols and we drew a lot of lines and some lines we still have to draw. out. There's still a lot of things that I have to draw that I haven't drawn out. But um, the main thing that we saw in Daniel's last vision is that it's this understanding of the prophetic mirror, that that's what Daniel hasn't understood. Anyway, when it comes to this, uh, to, to the Daniel's last vision. It's this whole purpose of it. And, and this idea that this is the mirror, the prophetic mirror, is extremely important. I, th I think it's the main point that we learned in Daniel's last vision, is that it's, it's um, the, the mar, Mara, right? So not the Mara. The Mara is the 2300, but the Mara, that is the looking glass vision, is this revelation of Jesus Christ as seen in the prophetic periods, right? So the understanding of, of this revelation of Christ, of how this is seen, how this, this experience that Daniel needs to have that is, is the everlasting gospel, you know, the, the, the touches and so forth. So there's so much here and it's it's so far reaching and so it, it's a thread that ties so many things together in our understanding of Seventh Day Adventists. It's it's almost impossible to really explain it. But, you know, the paper is going to try to do the best that it can. And so so we've struggled with a lot of things in this study. But the main thing that we have really struggled with is ourselves. Right. That, that is what this is about. In studying God's word, it's not to just know about what Daniel's last vision is and how to interpret the different verses. It's really knowing Christ. And, and that's what Daniel's last vision is about. So you have these different, you know, prophecies. You have the Kazon and you have the Debar, right? And you have, uh, what's the other one? The, the, the Mare, right? So you, you have the Kazon, the 2520, you have the Debar, which is the 70 weeks, and the Mara, which is the, and it should be in the other order, Kazon, Mara, Debar, 
the Mara is the 2300 days, the Mara, and then the Bar is the 70 weeks, and then you have the Mara. So Mara, I guess it's Mara, which is the 2300 days, the Debar, which is the 70 weeks, and then the Mara vision, the looking glass vision. So it's a 3-1 combination. And that's the main point of, to me, of understanding these prophetic periods and how they work together. But there's obviously a lot more detail that uh, is involved in that. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study today. We know, Lord, that um, you have been teaching us. There's much that we have to apply to our lives. And um, we pray for one another that you can continue to help us in our day-to-day -day walk with you. We ask for your angels' care and protection for each one, our family, our loved ones. And um, we ask, Lord, that uh, as we go through our day, that we can be aware of you speaking to us and that we can obey your voice. Bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.